In this video, I'd like to share three different ways that you can work with in-log footage within Premiere Pro. Now, before moving forward, there's just a couple things I wanna point out just so we're all on the same page here. Uh, just to show you, I am working on Premiere Pro version 25.0.0. And the reason I bring that up is I believe some of this stuff is new to this version. Um, I might be wrong about that, but uh, I think it is either way. Um, just wanted to point that out. There is some cool stuff coming in Premiere Pro beta, um, but that stuff is still subject to change. So I'm not really gonna worry about that right now. Um, the other thing I'd like to look at is both my project settings and the sequence settings that I'm working with right now. So if I come down to my project settings and specifically look in color, uh, you can see that there's an auto detect log video color space. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit. I recommend having it turned on, but if you're using in log, uh, you're gonna see it's actually, um, doesn't seem to really detect it. I'm not entirely sure why, um, but we will be looking at that. Uh, the viewer gamma, you'll notice that this um, will change how your uh, screen looks a little bit. And it's kind of trying to compensate from my understanding to the different types of playbacks that you might be viewing uh, your footage on. So this is something to consider. I leave mine on web because a vast majority of my, uh, the videos that we're doing are ending up on um, being viewed on the web. Um, it doesn't change it that drastically, but you might find that you get a bit of a difference when you do that, but that's just something to keep in mind. But we're gonna move on real quick and look at our sequence settings. We can see that this is all very standard, but again, if we come into color management, now this is important because this is actually something that as far as I can tell, will be changing coming with the new beta version once that becomes the uh, you know released version. But you're gonna wanna leave this on Rec. 709. And the reason for that is that in log, while being a Rec. 2020 color space, is not actually HDR. HDR is the Rec. 2100 color space with the HLG and the PQ. And if you know that stuff, then you know it. But ultimately, Rec. 2100 and Rec. 2020 use the same wide color gamut, but the dynamic range values is what changes. So since Rec 2020 is not an option for the color space, and since most people are gonna be delivering in Rec 709, I'd highly recommend keeping this on Rec 709 unless you know that uh, you're working in an HDR uh, deliverable, then you know, you're probably not watching this video anyways. But that's also a reason to have on auto tone mapping because it says to tone map HDR media. Now, even though we're not working with an HDR workflow, like I said, Rec 2020 and Rec 2100 both use the same wide color gamut. So even though the dynamic range values might not be the exact same, um, the colors, right? So you're taking a Rec 2020 color space, which has way more color than Rec 709, and you're trying to squish it all down. So this auto tone mapping will help convert those color and luminance values and such into a Rec 709 color space. So you definitely wanna have that checked. Um, and we will, I will show you what happens if you don't have that checked uh, in a little bit. The first method you can use to convert your in-log footage to Rec. 709 is by using the input LUT option up here in the basic correction tab. Now, I would recommend that you only use this method if you were using an external monitor when you were recording and you had the input LUT loaded onto the monitor so you could monitor what that LUT was going to be doing to the footage. And the reason I say that is because when you select a LUT from this drop down menu, you now are working with a Rec. 709 clip. It's as if you didn't even record an in log. The reason that's important is because you will find that making adjustments to your footage, even here in Premiere Pro where it's not all that great, but trying to make adjustments to footage that you've already converted it's not good. You're not working with the metadata that the clip originally had. So that's why I recommend this is like a fast turnaround type method. You know what you shot the footage in a way because you were using the LUT to monitor it and you knew what was going to happen. So if we go ahead and say, let's convert it to in log BT 2020 to Rec 709 and you can see it changes the image. Now, whether you like it or not is really not what we're talking about here. This is more just to demonstrate how you would do this. And just for the sake of it, uh, we'll go ahead and click through. This is the new black and white. 
uh, conversion LUT from red. And then we have the film bias. And so that looks a little less saturated than the normal one uh, that they've given us now. Then you have the bleach bypass. This is gonna give you more contrast, push your highlights a little bit more and be really desaturated. And then we have the film bias offset, which is gonna be a little bit more pleasing, but you're gonna get a little bit more of that teal and orange vibe going on. Um, so again, this is again why I would say that this method, if you're filming with an external recorder and you're monitoring the footage, uh, and you're applying these LUTs in the monitor to see what it's gonna do, then this can be a great method. But if you're gonna wanna start making adjustments to this, you're gonna find that it's, it's difficult. And even with the ProRes, if you look down here a little bit closer, so this is my ProRes 422, same clip. Um, gonna apply the same thing. And if we come back here and put on this one, they look virtually identical. And even if in ProRes 422, if I start messing with it, you're getting that typical Premiere Pro complaint of it's just a brightness slider, right? You're not really like, yeah, you're changing it, but you're not really getting an exposure change, right? And you might notice that right here next to it, I have the ProRes RAW clip. In RAW isn't usable in Premiere, and that's a whole separate conversation, but that's why I don't have it in here. Um, but this is actually a question for you guys because this isn't converted at all. If you, if I click on the clip here, no input LUT, I haven't done anything to it, but Premiere Pro is like already changing it. And it's interesting because if I come back to my project and I click on the properties and pull this up, it sees it as Apple ProRes Raw HQ, but it sees it as a Rec. 709 color space, but it's clearly starting to convert it because that's no longer log. So if somebody knows why that's happening, please let me know. So moving forward, we're not gonna be looking at it anymore. But anyways, to really drive home just how bad using the input LUT uh, method is and why uh, I used to get really frustrated with this, and I'm sure other people have gotten frustrated, but this is a clip from a recent wedding that we shot. And if I were to say, okay, this exposure is not where I, I, I overexposed this, which I did do intentionally, but that's a separate you know, argument. But anyways, let's say you have this clip and you're like, man, I need to, I need to bring this down, right? <laughs> well, if you just put this in, okay, not too bad, right? Not a terrible image. But if I start to bring it down, if you really look at the waveform, the sky, which is this top, white line just sort of moves with each other. And again, we're just getting this kind of darkening effect. It's not really changing exposure. And a lot of people, a lot of people complain about this. So one thing that you can do here is actually apply the LUT to an adjustment layer. And this kind of works as a um, node in DaVinci Resolve, if you're familiar with that at all. If you're not, then this kind of works like Photoshop. And if you're not familiar with that either, that's okay. But essentially, it's like a trickle down system. So this LUT's being applied to the clips below it, but in a non-destructive way. So you can still play with the metadata that's in the clip, right? The in-law clip, regardless if it's H.265 or ProRes. If you start moving this, it looks like the same thing's happening. Well, that's because I'm clicked on the adjustment layer. You have to click on the actual clip. And now when you move it, it's not drastically different, but there is a little bit more of a gradual change. Same thing that happens here if it's applied on the adjustment layer and then you come to the clip, it's the same thing happens, right? Now this isn't a super dynamic scene. So then if we come back to this other clip, same LUTs applied as you can see up here, right? Well, as I start bringing this exposure down, you just get a better overall result. It's still not great, it's still not great, but you'll get you in a better place. And so I would highly recommend as a second method to apply whatever LUT that you wanna to use to an adjustment layer above the clips that you're wanting to make the adjustments to, and then you can still use the metadata that's in the original clip. That leads us into the third and final method. If we come over here, this goes into this new settings tab. 
And if it's not new, it's new to me. <laughs> so um, anyways, so this brings up a whole host of interesting things. Now here's those project settings that we looked at earlier. And then here's that working color space, the sequence, right? So if you don't do this when you start it, you can always do this from here as well. So it's just giving you more than lo one location to do this. And I'm not gonna go through each one of these settings. I would recommend having these first two ones uh, checked. And then again, we already went through these settings down here, but this is where it's interesting because you're supposed to detect the log footage, but as you can see, it sees log as Rec 709, not in log. And so this is really frustrating. And there's been other videos about NLOG that say that you can just come into Override Media Color Space and change it to Rec 2020 and it'll fix it. Well, some truth to that, but things have actually gotten better because now they actually have NLOG Rec 2020. Now, when you do this, boom, now you get a converted, right? So really this method is if you don't like adjustment layers or if you don't like, um, any of Nikon's LUTs that are provided or you're not getting good results with third-party LUTs. Um, these are all conversion LUTs, by the way, not creative LUTs, okay, there's a difference. But this now lets you use Premiere Pro to convert your footage from N-Log. Like it now recognizes N-Log there. It just doesn't recognize it when you bring it into the system, which is pretty frustrating. Um, but anyways, so now you can do that, but you'll notice that again, if you use the exposure slider, you just kind of get that darkening effect. Well, everything else seems to work pretty normally, but for whatever reason, you have to use the exposure slider down here in the input tone mapping, which is why you need to have the input tone mapping media turned on. And so, and then it has other options if you don't like what it's doing, um, but, by channel is the one that's kind of supposed to be used for log footage. So you can play around with those, but keep in mind that you would want to make exposure adjustments, which is still not true exposure because it's not raw footage, but you'd want to make that here, okay? And this is where it also kind of gets interesting because if we come to this clip and we turn on the override media and we go to in log and we have tone mapping on, this looks pretty good, right? But if we turn tone mapping off, right? Again, this isn't HDR footage, but it's the same color gamut. If we turn this off, it doesn't know how to pull all of that data back in. We're just getting a really clipped image now. And even, and now we can't do anything with the exposure down here, right? You can't make any of those changes. So even though you basically have just converted it to Rec 709 and you still will get some good exposure movement here. It just depends. But if you turn on tone mapping, you start with a way more balanced image and it won't necessarily pull as much, but it's going to be better. So those are your three options when working with in-log footage within Premiere Pro. I hope that you found this helpful. As always, this really wasn't meant to solve all the problems, but just try to quickly introduce a couple different options, three options that you could use if you're using Premiere Pro and you're struggling or you're new to InLog and you kind of want to dive into it. I promise you it's not that scary and I promise you that InLog is worth it. And I hope that Nikon will begin to put out more information and more resources on how to take advantage of it in different platforms. But as we can see, Premiere Pro is definitely not the priority and it's definitely kind of swimming up river a little bit here, um, but it's definitely still possible. So don't give up. Um, as always, if you have any questions or if there's any other specific things uh, you'd like me to cover, I'd be more than happy to look at that kind of stuff. But with all that said, until the next one, see ya.